Members of the committee, please come to order. We meet today indeed to elect our next representative to the U.S. Congress. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to be in a room filled with kindred spirits. In the same room, separated by one day and a gulf of political ideology, Montana Republicans and Montana Democrats struggled to choose their candidates. We have just one seat in the House, just one voice in a cacophony of 434 others, and we have a chance to really make it count. You have an important decision to make tonight. We need to put forward the best candidate who can win. My name is Rob Quist, and I want to be your congressman. Good evening. I'm running for Congress so that your voice is heard in Washington, D.C. We are at a crossroads, Montana. We are all concerned that the current administration will be act too swiftly and recklessly. This race is ground zero in the Liberals' attempt to stop the Trump train, and I won't allow that to happen. As a poet musician, I ask you to look outside the bubble of Helena to a man who has represented Montana from, from behind a different kind of microphone. We're already in the final lap of this race. If you select me, I start off with 84% name ID across the state. Has everybody got their ballots? Yes. We're here for one purpose today, and that's to get to 50% plus one. I'm pleased to announce that the Montana Republican Party has a nominee. The winner with 150.5 votes, Mr. Greg G. at 40. I am humbled by the confidence you've placed in me, and I look forward to going to work. Thank you very much. The final vote, 90 votes for the next congressman from the state of Montana, Rob Quinn. I'm very honored to take on the mantle and carry carried the banner for the Democratic Party forward in this process. Thank you so much, everybody. Just 83 days from the election, the contest is set, and voters already have some opinions about these political newcomers. I know enough that I don't want them as my representative. I think they're great Montanans, you know, and I think either one would uh, represent Montana quite well. He is going to be siding on the interest of Montana businesses. He sounds like a progressive. Both candidates answer some tough questions and make their case to voters. Will Montanans choose Bozeman Republican Greg Gianforte? Or Flathead Democrat Rob Quist to claim Montana's vacancy in the House? Support for this program is provided by the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. And by viewers like you, who are friends of Montana PBS. Thank you. This will be one of the shortest campaigns in the history of the state. Not only that, the entire nation is watching to see if there's any backlash to President Trump in this traditionally red state. So the stakes are high, and voters have precious little time and information to make up their minds. I don't know a great deal about the Republican candidate. Unfortunately, I just have not had much um, education on Quist as of yet. The more informed you are, the better you are, no matter what. I'm certainly interested in learning more about both candidates. My father uh, was an engineer. He worked for General Electric. So I started life in San Diego, California. The oldest of three brothers, Gianforte's youth was steeped in math. Along with his father's engineering career, his mother was a high school math teacher. By the time I was three, uh, we had moved to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and that's where I uh, really had my upbringing. I was there from three until graduating from high school. 56-year-old Greg Gianforte says he learned some of his most important lessons outside the classroom on the field. Learn a lot about teamwork. You also learn that getting the ball in the end zone is much easier if you run three to five yard plays and not try and throw Hail Mary passes. 
He was junior and senior class president and went on to earn a bachelor's in electrical engineering and a master's in computer science from Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey. He was just three years out of college when he started a software company called Brightwork Development and hit pay dirt. I partnered with a number of other people, uh, four other men on, on that business, and we had good success. The business grew to 75 people, and we had about 150,000 installations globally. The company was eight years old when he sold it to McAfee for $10 million. It was 1994, Gianforte was married with three young kids, and he was already a millionaire. Did you think about retiring then? This is a really good question because uh, I did think about it a lot. I think I was 32 years old when I sold uh, Brightwork. Uh, and it, you know, I didn't have to work. Um, but I do believe that, and, and this actually goes to my Christian faith a little bit in that I believe that I am a steward of the skills and the resources I've been given. And I need to use them for some productive use. And what I concluded in the end was that my purpose was to create high-wage jobs. And that was the best way I could serve other people. 24 years ago, Susan and I were deciding where to make our home and raise our kids. We chose Montana. When we started our company, Right Now Technologies, just at our kitchen table with $5,000, we picked Montana. They launched the tiny software startup in 1997 and watched it grow to a global company with over 1,000 employees. We ended up creating over 550 high-wage jobs here in Bozeman. Uh, average wage, almost $90,000 a year. Gianforte says Right Now Technologies helped businesses handle customer questions and complaints using artificial intelligence. This gave customers an immediate answer, and it allowed companies to trim staff from their customer service departments. In 2011, Oracle bought Right Now Technologies for $1.5 billion. Gianforte believes the secret to success and satisfaction is finding what he calls the nobleness of your job, even if you're the person who cleans the building. When you describe a job in terms of the activity, you, you lose the nobleness of the work. So the reality is, and I would share this story, if the janitor didn't come in at night and empty the waste paper baskets and no one else did that job, every single office in the building would fill up with trash and no one would get their job done, and the company would fail. So the janitor doesn't empty waste paper baskets. What they do is they create a productive work environment for everyone else, and their job is just as important as everyone else in the organization. So do you feel like that somebody who does empty waste paper baskets can be as satisfied in their job as somebody who created the company or who works higher level and gets paid a little bit better? Do you think that each of those jobs can be as personally satisfying? I do. While Gianforte was creating his Montana success story in the 90s, his challenger, 69-year-old Rob Quist, was struggling. It was a struggle he didn't see coming after years of his own success in an iconic band, a band whose members all had their roots firmly planted in Montana. I grew up in a ranching farming community, and so my ties to that way, to, to live, people living close to the land, are really palpable. I stand before you as a native son of the big sky. Quist was born in Cutbank. He was fourth in a family of six kids, and his parents were farmers and ranchers. He says exploring the outdoors as a young Boy Scout taught him Montana's rugged individualism. Many were the times that we would take 100-mile hikes through the mountains, and it was here that I became uh, very interested and learned to love Montana's wild and open spaces. It's almost like we're closer to our, our frontier heritage. And I think that's what makes it special here. This, uh, this land that we live in is, is really, truly some of the most amazing country on earth. And it really has shaped us as people. And, Quist uh, acquired a taste for competitive pursuits and politics in high school. He was an aggressive basketball player at Cutbank High School. And by his senior year, he was co-captain of the Class B state championship basketball team and class president. People who know me, I uh, can't believe that I'm this competitive about this thing, but, uh, but you know, looking back to my, my basketball days, I was very competitive. He was good enough to play basketball for the Grizzlies his freshman year at the University of Montana, and he studied music and physical therapy. In the end, though, music won out. 
and in 1971, he left the university to start the Mission Mountain Wood Band with a friend. Quist says a music producer helped him realize he should stop writing love songs and start using all the time he spent in Montana's backcountry as his muse. He was the one that gave me the gift of thinking it was cool to write songs about Montana. We were representatives of the state of Montana. I mean, we, it was, well, we brought, conjured up all those images of the big sky country through our music and how we looked, how we dressed, the music we played. The Mission Mountain Wood Band amassed a dedicated following all over the United States, and they released two albums. Eventually, Quist formed a new band and embarked on a successful songwriting career. He had a wife and two young children, and he was writing and recording television and radio ads for big companies like Levi's and Coors. This was probably the mid-90s, and um, I was really on a roll. You know, we were touring nationally. I had a killer band. And I had the bus and, and uh, the sound company. I had a record contract offer. And so uh, things could not, we were, I had a five-year plan and it was in the fourth year and we were ready to pop. And then when I was down in Reno, I was performing with Michael Martin Murphy and we were working out and he looked at me and he said, Rob, you look white as a ghost, what's going on? Quist was diagnosed with a life-threatening gallbladder infection. Even worse, during the surgery, the doctor accidentally severed a bile duct. I had to have a major reconstructive surgery. And I know that a lot of people that have had the same thing that I have had did not survive. And so I went into a tailspin. You know, my band uh, broke out. I lost my record contract because I couldn't tour. And uh, my band uh, you know, went to play with other people. I had to sell the bus. The medical bills mounted, and Quist says he lost his health insurance because the gallbladder problem was ruled a pre-existing condition. He had to pay for more reconstructive surgeries out of pocket. He says they just couldn't make enough money to pay all their bills. And years later, the state of Montana filed $15,000 in liens against them for unpaid taxes. He also defaulted on a $10,000 bank loan. We didn't declare bankruptcy like we probably should have, but that's just not in our makeup. So we, we just fought through it, and now we're back on our feet. It took two decades, but the Quists finally paid off the last of the liens and the medical bills in May of 2016. Gianforte declined to comment on Quist's financial troubles. He also did not want to comment on what led to a $3,600 lien being filed against him in the early 90s. He did say he paid off that lien in three months. Quist believes if he had not lost his insurance over the pre-existing condition, he never would have faced such financial hardship. And I think that many Montana families will understand it because, um, you know, many families go through a situation where they have a medical emergency like that that, that uh, will sink the family. So I'm just glad to be sitting here today. <laughs> and you probably feel pretty strongly about Obamacare then, right? I do, you know, I do. I think that we need to, to strengthen it and not repeal it because there will be so many Montanans and, and Americans that will be thrown off health care. And I know what it's like to not be on health care. I know what that's like. If you work hard, you should be able to afford to see a doctor. And we need to strengthen the a ACA and not repeal it. We need to repeal and replace Obamacare. What would you like to see stay in a, in a repeal and replace situation? Well, one thing is I think it's good that we allow people to keep insurance even if they have pre-existing conditions. Um, I think that would stay in any program going forward. So Quist and Gianforte have some common ground here. Another area they agree on when it comes to health care? Addressing the high cost of prescription drugs. But that's where it ends. We don't need to send, send Nancy Pelosi a court musician who wants to socialize medicine. My opponent has been advocating for a 100% government-run health care program. That is absolutely the wrong solution. Do you think that the best option would be single payer? Well, you know, I'm on uh, Social Security and Medicare, and, you know, it's, it's, uh, I think it really works well for, for people who have that. You walk in, you show your card, and there's no questions asked, you know, and what could be more simple? Medicare is technically a U.S. single-payer health program, and it's incredibly popular, especially in Montana, where 17 percent of the population are seniors. Not surprisingly, both candidates say they will support and defend Medicare and Social Security. For some voters, though, one hot-button Western issue... Right now, our Montana way of life and our public lands are under attack. ...has eclipsed concerns over health care. What's your biggest concern right now? 
for the state of Montana lands. I still uh, appreciate very much having access to public land. The transfer and eventual sale of our public lands is nothing more than theft against our children and our grandchildren, and I will steadfastly oppose it. Transferring millions of acres of federal land to the states is an official plank of both the National and Montana Republican Party platforms. Montana has about 25 million acres of federal public land. Critics say states just don't have the resources to care for that land the way the federal government does, and they would be forced to sell it eventually. People are very worried. I mean, um, I have conference calls with people who are in sportsman's group, and they are fired up like you cannot believe. I mean, it's, it's palpable. I mean, they want me to win this so bad just for that reason alone. And the issue crosses party lines in Montana. A discussion over public lands divided this room of Republicans, with some favoring deed transfer and others staunchly opposing it. Why cannot we have the federal lands transferred to Montana? The federal <laughs> lands belong to all Americans. Gianforte thinks there's a middle ground. I believe better decisions get made about our land if they're made here locally. So I am supportive of starting pilot projects that where the state manages some of our federal lands. Well, I don't know, to me that's just a, that's just a first step, you know. Um, Quist and other public land supporters are suspicious because many of the same lawmakers who are pushing for these management pilot projects are also pushing for full deed transfer. Gianforte says he isn't one of them and that he is completely against deed transfer. Do you worry at all that that might be a first step, that that's just kind of a first step in this continuum of, of transferring land eventually? Well, I, I think I've, um, I spoke to this. What we're doing today is Like you don't worry that that's what's going on. You don't worry that that, that might be a next step. If we, like I was saying, you let the genie out of the bottle type thing, do you don't think that's going to happen? What we're doing today is not working. You know, we have tinder boxes, we have dead standing timber. Uh, we have a timber industry that's almost extinguished. Uh, we have uh, habitat that doesn't support wildlife the way it should. Uh, we need to start managing our lands, and I think decisions about the lands could be better made here locally than by bureaucrats back in Washington. So these pilot projects, not deed transfer, but increased local management is the right next step. And not selling off any land. Um... Public lands must stay in public hands. No one's talking about this. This is, this is honestly uh, outrageous rhetoric from the other side. Uh, no one's talking about selling off public lands. But a recent bill in Congress proposed to do just that, to sell off over three million acres of federal land. Intense public outcry led the sponsor to pull the bill. Gianforte says he would have voted against it. We're going to keep public lands in public hands because it's part of who we are, and there's just no, no debating on that. There are politicians and Special interest groups who are going to great lengths to take away our access to public lands and destroy our Montana way of life. And my opponent, he is one of them. And if he understood our Montana values, he would not have bought up land and then built a fence to keep Montanans out. Why did he block stream access, you know, and, and why is he being supported by these groups whose goal it is, you know, to, to, uh, to transfer lands, you know. So talk is cheap, but I think that uh, it, there's an old biblical phrase, by their fruits ye shall know them. And so it's not what someone says, but in their actions that you have to judge people. Quist is talking about an issue that dogged Gianforte in his race for governor. Gianforte owns property on the East Gallatin River in Bozeman. For years, anglers had used a trail on the property that gave them easy access to a piece of public land that they otherwise would have had to wade the river to get to. Gianforte says they were not aware of the easement on the property when they bought it, so they assumed people were trespassing, and they fenced off the trail and put up no trespassing signs in the spring of 2008. By early March, Fish, Wildlife and Parks was hearing complaints from anglers. This is much ado about nothing. Uh, I a lot of people I've spoken with have had disagreements with state agencies, and I had one too. According to emails, FWP decided to contact the Gianfortes in March of 2008 and ask them to remove the fencing and the signs. I think it is time they receive a letter from FWP reminding them that this is a public easement. About two weeks later, Fish, Wildlife and Parks received a letter from attorney Art Wittick. In the letter, the Gianfortes and two neighbors claimed the previous owner did not have the legal right to grant the easement and that no one used it. 
Wittick wrote, My clients request that the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks relinquish the easement in order to avoid litigating this issue. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks says the easement was legal and they refused to give it up. About six months into the dispute, the Gianfortes discovered that a portion of the public trail actually did come off the easement and onto their private property. It was a survey error. They thought it was in one location, it was actually another location. Gianforte says it was taking a long time to convince FWP to visit the property so they could show them where the easement really was. So in May of 2009, Wittick filed a lawsuit on behalf of the Gianfortes. Once again, they tried to force FWP to give up the public easement. Gianforte again argues the easement is not legal and that anglers already have adequate places to fish nearby making the easement on his property unnecessary. The lawsuit does not mention any survey problem, but Gianforte claims the suit was only meant to force the agency to address that error. It was a shot over the bow to get him to come out and actually walk the property with us. So the lawsuit wasn't actually filed to abandon the, you know, this, this public access. They made a mistake. Uh, unfortunately, it took us 18 months to get their attention to actually get it resolved. When they showed up, a handshake, the whole thing was resolved. Okay, and I just want to make sure that it wasn't like you filed it because you really wanted it It was abandoned. never an attempt to uh, restrict access. He was trying to eliminate access. That's the key here. It's eliminate access. The two sides did eventually meet and walk the property together, and there was discussion about moving the easement to allow anglers to use the old trail instead of wading the river. However, the Gianfortes decided against that idea, and in the end, FWP agreed to move the trail, the easement remained the same, and the Gianfortes dropped the lawsuit. Quist says he doesn't understand why Gianforte was so heavy-handed if it was simply a trail that needed to be moved, and he's using the dispute to his advantage on the campaign trail. You will never have to worry about me suing the, the people of Montana to block stream access. <laughs> But Gianforte has a criticism of his own to level at Quist. My opponent has said that we ought to take our cars down to DMV, register them, and then register our guns. He has called for a national gun registry. That's a first step towards confiscation of weapons. We've seen it in other countries when it occurs. Uh, it is absolutely inconsistent with the views of most Montanans. So I am, uh, I'll be very clear, this is a huge point of distinction between me and my opponent. What is your take on gun registry for any type of gun? Well, first of all, that was total a falsehood. That was taken totally out of context. And for, uh, for them to question my, uh, my stance on this is almost laughable because I grew up in a ranching and farming community. And you know, first of all, we don't say gun control. We say gun safety. And that's something I learned from the time that I was a young boy. So I totally support the Second Amendment rights, and I think the laws that we have in the state work just fine for the state of Montana. Do you think that the gun laws should be reduced at all? Are you comfortable with those, or would you, as a representative in Congress, want to roll back some of this if it's possible on the congressional level? Well, we need to go back to where I started, which is the biggest issue we have is federal overreach. So um, I will always side with, if it's not explicitly in the Constitution, it should be defined at the state level. Now, in the case of gun rights, though, it is in the Constitution, and it says that the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That will be my guiding light in considering any legislation. Back. In an effort to outgun each other, both candidates released ads where they're shooting electronics. Voters say they expect some negativity and the candidates to throw some barbs. But they've been disappointed by how early the ads have gotten ugly. I'm hearing a lot of negative campaigning, a lot of, you know, creepy music with the Rob Quist pictures. I am inundated online with ads, uh, with rhetoric that I find very unproductive and off-putting. The ads are likely to get even uglier. Montana's May election will make it the next state to reveal how voters are feeling about President Trump. The theme of this election is very simple. This election will be a referendum on Donald Trump and this administration. There's going to be a lot of resources coming into the state. We're going to have national attention. And we need every single person in this room to do everything you can to make sure we win. The eyes of the nation are on us here today. We will provide a blueprint for how a rural red state can capture a seat in the U.S. Congress for Democrats.
If we stand together, we cannot be denied. Today, more than ever, we must make our voices heard. We must stand up and unify and march. And when you cannot stand, I will stand up for you. We are ahead in the polls. I'm encouraged by that. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is the, the other side is highly motivated. Just how motivated the voters are is something both candidates are eager to know. I think it's a, an extremely important um, election. I'm hopeful that we can send a message. Luckily for them and for Montanans, they won't have to wait long for the answer. Support for Vacancy in the House was provided by the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans, and by viewers like you, who are friends of Montana PBS. Thank you.